All right, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's always fun to see everybody sort of live. Um, hope to see a couple of you uh, in Boston. I think our Chicago, San Francisco, um, uh, and other live events have all been a lot of fun. Um, so today I'm going to give a quick talk, just highlighting some of the molecules that we've covered over the last six months. Uh, there were so many super interesting things uh, and so much that happened over the last six months. It was really hard to narrow this down to just 10 molecules, but hopefully you'll find this stuff as cool as I did. And before we get started, I do want to thank our sponsor today, Porton, uh, one of the world's leading CDMOs. Um, Porton uh, specializes in chemistry support for uh, everything you need in drug discovery. So everything from preclinical services, from compound synthesis to process optimization to structural elucidation, all the way through to the support for uh, phase three and commercial molecules. So they do GMP, uh, kilo to ton scale, manufacturing, process verification, uh, all the good stuff. Um, People in the U.S. may not be as familiar with Porton, but they have been growing incredibly quickly. They have over 5,000 employees and 1,300 R&D staff as of May. Uh, they work with over 700 clients, including 80% of the top 50 pharma. Uh, and so far, they've completed over 2,000 projects. And in 2021, they did over half a billion, almost half a billion dollars in revenue. So uh, very experienced partners. In the product portfolio or project portfolio, they work with a diverse range of clients. About 30% or 36% are from Big Pharma, 30% are from biotechs, uh, and the remainder from consumer health and other areas. But they have tons of experience from preclinical to clinical to uh, supporting NDA filing and commercial launches. So if you need that next uh, kilo tox lot or your next dog study or Sino study, uh, think about reaching out to Porton. And I think Surge from Porton is on the call today. So with that, uh, we'll move on to the subject of uh, this talk. So again, it was really hard to wind this down to just five highlights from drug approvals and five highlights from molecules a month, but I think there's a lot to say about each of these. We're gonna break this up into uh, two parts because there again was so much to cover. So in a couple of weeks, we'll be doing part two, where we'll talk about highlights from our drug discovery tech review, uh, emerging tools and modalities, talking about some billion dollar molecules that have been recently acquired, and some moving targets, targets where there have been some clinical updates and regulatory actions that people might want to pay attention to. So starting with approvals, um, there were 14 new molecular entities approved by the FDA to date in Q2 and Q3, um, and more from the EMA. Uh, one of the molecules I have to mention is Ducravacitinib, or SOTIC2. Um, it's got a great name, and I hope when Nimbus gets their TIC2 uh, inhibitor approved, they call it Wow TIC2 or Very TIC2. I would love that. Um, this is newly approved for plaque psoriasis, and it's an allosteric inhibitor. So even though it does look like it's got a hinge binder, um, which you know technically it does, uh, and it looks like an active site inhibitor, it actually targets a pseudokinase domain, the JH2 domain on TIC2. So the way this works is um, by binding to that second domain, it stabilizes auto-inhibitory actions between uh, the JH2 domain and the catalytically active JH1 domain, inhibiting uh, the JH1 domain. Um, this enables much greater selectivity, um, and uh, the promise of these TIC2 inhibitors, which are expected to be blockbusters, uh, is that they may have similar anti-inflammatory effects to JAK inhibitors, but without the safety issues. A couple of interesting things about this scientifically. So uh, first, this is the first de novo deuterated drug approval. So there are uh, there is another deuterated drug, but um, it was a follow-on drug where the non-deuterated version had already been approved. So this is the first approval where the actual drug um, with the deuterium is the first version of the drug to be approved. It's also the first pseudokinase targeting drug. So there are a variety of kinases that have uh, this sort of pseudokinase regulatory domain, uh, but this is the first drug targeting one of those domains to be approved. So hopefully we'll see more of those uh, kinds of drugs targeting other kinases um, that'll help achieve similar selectivity. And this is obviously the first take two drug approval. So very exciting. 
the deuteriums on this methyl amide on the left, uh, they suppress ND methylation uh, via the uh, kinetic isotope effect. And that actually prevents the formation of a less selective metabolite, the free amide. So it's a pretty interesting geomedic chem story uh, that was published in 2019 by, by the BMS team. Uh, so definitely worth reading more about. Second approval I have to mention uh, was an EMA approval. Uh, so this drug, lenacapavir, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, was first approved in Europe. Uh, we're expecting the U.S. approval in December. So the Paducah date, I think, is December 27th. A uh, super cool molecule. It is given twice yearly after a two-week oral lead-in. Uh, it's SC dosing, and the drug over six months covers six times the protein-adjusted EC95, which is insane. I think I've seen you know EC90 coverage, EC50 coverage. Uh, 6x EC95 for six months is is incredible, especially given the target. Uh, is essentially a protein-protein interaction. So the HIV capsid, uh, which encapsulates the HIV's RNA um, or nucleotides, uh, is made up of uh, multiple monomers of capsid protein that glue together to form this shell. Uh, so this molecule actually accelerates the formation of those capsids, but into a form that uh, isn't as competent in you know, opening, releasing the RNA in a couple steps um, in the HIV life cycle. We have an article coming up on the MedChem highlights from the discovery of lenticapavir, so stay tuned for that. But one thing I thought was particularly interesting from the discovery campaign was that they were actually, uh, they used two HTS conditions to identify hits. Um, they were looking for inhibitors of capsid-capsid interactions, which uh, never led to any potent molecules. As you can imagine, mass action just really makes that challenging. And so surprisingly, uh, it was found that accelerating capsid assembly turned out to be the better route um, where this capsid is assembled into um, an incompetent state. So very cool. One statistic that they gave in their nature paper uh, or science paper was they used 70 grams of purified HIV capsid protein to conduct these early screens. And uh, I'm looking forward to that protein sciences paper as well, because I'm curious how they managed to stabilize all that stuff so it doesn't just oligomerize spontaneously. Very cool. The third approval I wanna highlight is Mavicampton. Um, it's a first-in-class oral cardiac myosin inhibitor. So it inhibits uh, motor protein. Uh, it was acquired in a crazy $13 billion acquisition by BMS of myocardia. And clinically, it improves symptoms and functional capacity in uh, heart disease called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I think if anyone had been told 10 years ago that we were going to see motor protein inhibitors, uh, specifically for myosin, um, approved to treat heart disease, you know, where you're inhibiting myosin in heart muscle tissue, uh, people would have thought you were crazy. I, I certainly would never have thought that you could treat heart disease by inhibiting motor proteins. Um, but it does appear to work clinically, um, and it's dosed five megs once daily orally. It does carry a black box warning uh, due to risk of heart failure. Um, and so to address that, there's a REMS, um, REMS safety system and monitoring system to make sure that people don't uh, maintain too high doses and um, have heart failure. And so you wanna keep the dose of this titrated. But one of the problems is because it does have victim drug risk in terms of DDIs, uh, co-medications can cause the drug levels to be too high. And so other drugs that are in trials are trying to address that liability by either reducing perpetrator DDI risk or victim drug DDI risk um, to make sure that uh, the molecules can be administered safely. The fourth molecule um, in a totally different space is uh, otosiconazole or Vivchoa. It's an oral selective azole antifungal for recurrent vulvovaginal candidiasis. I'm not sure if the disease or the drug is harder, pronounce, harder to pronounce for this one, um, but both super interesting. So this is the first FDA-approved drug for RBVC. 
the reason I found this particularly interesting was uh, it's well known that azoles have SIP liabilities because the way they work is by binding to fungal SIP proteins uh, by you know, having an azole group like an imidazole that coordinates to uh, the heme. In cancer, if you've worked in cancer or in other diseases uh, where people's immune systems are often suppressed, you know that you often have to give your drugs in combination with azoles uh, because fungal infections are super common uh, when you have a suppressed immune system. And obviously that's a big problem with these azole drugs because they just have DDIs with you know, everything, right? So new antifungals are badly needed, both due to resistance and due to these DDI issues, but everybody, everybody uses azoles. So this one's cool because it was designed to be selective against human SIPs. And this molecule in particular is over 2000 X selective against human SIP 51. I thought from the MedChem campaign, it was particularly interesting that they took this um, weaker azole binding approach where they moved from the triazole present in voriconazole, for example, and opted to go for a less potent initial molecule with a tetrazole. So even though they lost potency, they were able to gain back um, some, or they were able to reduce the activity against human SIPs. And by building out the potency of this molecule in other areas beyond the team binding motif, they were able to find ways to drive potency without necessarily increasing um, SIP liabilities. And so this molecule uh, has a much larger window um, against SIP inhibition relative to its antifungal activities. So hopefully we'll start to see this molecule being used in other indications beyond RBBC. Um, I'd expect to see it starting to be used um, in cancers and things like that shortly. Uh, molecule number five from approvals is bonaprazan. This was approved for Heliobacter pylori infection, which is a major cause of stomach ulcers in combination with antibiotics. It's given in a pack with uh, some antibiotics to be co-administered. This was actually first approved in Japan in 2014. So uh, it's the second of the molecules here that was approved elsewhere before the US. And it's the first novel acid suppressant in over 30 years in the US. So what's interesting about this is it reversibly inhibits the potassium, uh, proton potassium ATPase, which is the same target as proton pump inhibitors like ompremazole, uh, and it suppresses HCL secretion in the stomach. So PPIs are some of my favorite drugs because uh, like ompremazole, they have this crazy covalent mechanism where they get activated by acid and they rearrange to form a reactive metabolite, uh, super cool. But that mechanism of action is actually problematic because the ac acid activation also renders those drugs unstable at low pH. So because this molecule is reversible, it doesn't have that pH dependent mechanism of action. It's more stable in the stomach and can have a longer duration of activity. So it has a 24 hour plus retention time in the gastric mucosa. Uh, the way this works in combination with antibiotics is pretty cool. So by lowering the stomach pH, it actually encourages the Heliobacter pylori to divide and grow. And those growing bacteria are more vulnerable to antibiotics. So by sustaining this uh, lower pH, the antibiotics like um, uh, carbapenings and uh, things like that, those tend to be pretty acid labile as well. So it not only increases the duration of the antibiotics uh, activity in the stomach, it also makes them more effective against these bacteria by causing them to divide. Also, super interesting structure. I haven't seen a parole in a drug in a long time. So um, I thought the structure was pretty notable here. So if you thought these molecules were pretty interesting and want to know more, I do want to just pitch our uh, Molecules of the Month premium slide decks. So in these, we talk about how the drugs work, why the targets were selected, how the hits were discovered with structures, key steps in lead optimization, you know, what the disease that these drugs are treating are in the current treatment landscape for those diseases, any clinical data uh, that's available, human PK, patents, and industry history. We cover all of that in you know, easy to read slides for all of the molecules. So if you're interested in learning more about these molecules or the other 60 molecules that we reviewed in the last six months, uh, ask your company about premium. All right, so uh, for, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just talking about approvals. So we do cover approvals there as well. Um, so five molecules of the month that were super interesting. Uh, the first one is compound 33, a PKG1 
kinase activator. So this is an allosteric molecule, and unlike most kinase modulators, it activates rather than inhibits a protein. Um, I think uh, protein kinase activation is really uncommon, so this definitely raised some eyebrows on our team when we saw the paper. Uh, and this targets the CGMP pathway, which is really well validated in cardiovascular diseases. So CGMP is the effector molecule for a variety of um, drug mechanisms for cardiovascular diseases. So uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, um, uh, uh, guanylcyclase activators, the SGC molecules, uh, like one that was approved from, let's say, Boehringer Ingelheim or Bayer, Bayer uh, earlier this year. Um, all very cool mechanisms. So CGMP activates uh, this kinase, PKG kinase, which leads to smooth muscle relaxation in blood vessels and protection against cardiac stress. So uh, PKG has this domain that is uh, essentially a receptor for CGMP. Um, and so most PKG1 activators are derived from CGMP, which is the cyclic dinucleotide. Obviously, if you've seen the structures of these cyclic dinucleotides, they're not the most drug-like things in the world. They have two phosphates, you know, two sugar molecules. Um, and so ideally, uh, to find an oral drug, you'd want a starting point that's a bit different. So unlike most other PKG1 activators, which are either nucleotide analogs or peptides, this molecule was identified from a high-throughput screen and looks much better. The starting point on the bottom left was actually an imidazole, compound one, with a very weak activity in these cellular assays, about 50 micromolar in this PKG1 partial EC50 assay. Um, and a couple key steps in optimization were changing the imidazole to carboxylic acid and introducing a primary alcohol. One step that I thought was particularly interesting was actually introducing a nitro group um, at that meta position to the carboxylic acid actually improved potency pretty significantly. So that was an unusual, unusual lead optimization step. The second molecule of the month I want to highlight was uh, a compound related to a molecule that had been disclosed at a conference in Europe in 2021. So this compound 23 is an IL-17A protein-protein interaction modulator for inflammatory diseases. And actually, a prodrug of this molecule, LP0200, is a, uh, it's a phosphate prodrug based off of the pyrazole. Um, that's in phase one right now. So both of these molecules are from Leo Pharma. Um, and it's super interesting because it's a small molecule that's targeting a, uh, a target that has been um, well-established and well-validated as an antibody target. So Cosentix, Tal, Silic, uh, Benzelks, um, there are several, uh, several biologics that already work on this pathway. So this is a remarkably simple looking molecule for something that's targeting something that traditionally you needed biologics to target. Um, it is oral despite having two amides and three hydrogen bond donors. Um, and as the amides kind of hint, this came actually from a peptidic starting point. So compound one on the left here was uh, the starting point for this series of molecules, um, which was optimized by Pfizer to that macrocycle on the right. And this molecule uh, was basically developed from that macrocyclic starting point. So it'd be really interesting to see if this works in the clinic. It basically, uh, binds to a certain IL-17 dimer, preventing it from uh, interacting with the IL-17 receptor. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see if this has similar efficacy to antibodies. Molecule number three is another, again, super interesting story. So this is Denali-201. It's a LARC-2 inhibitor. It's oral and brain penetrant for Parkinson's disease. LARC2 is well known to be involved in familial and idiopathic Parkinson's disease and has been you know, super hot for a decade as a target because of its um, you know, genetic validation um, in that disease. You could kind of think of LARC2 as the A beta of Parkinson's disease. Um, people have sort of known that it's been important, but haven't known how to really drug it. Uh, one of the challenges was people had made selected LARC2 inhibitors in the past, uh, notably Merck and Genentech, and both published tool molecules in the space. Uh, but both 
Merck and Genentech independently had reported preclinical tox concerns, um, primarily monkey lung tox. So seeing that uh, preclinical, preclinically was enough to scare people off from the field. Uh, obviously, uh, lung tox in humans would not be something you'd want to see. But in partnership with a nonprofit, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, which focuses on Parkinson's disease, um, Denali and uh, MJFF were able to de-risk the sinopulmonary tox that was observed. They found it was non-adverse and reversible, and so they took the risk and took this into human clinical trials. So far, it seems to have paid off where there were no safety issues observed in phase one yet in humans, or no lung-related safety issues, and no significant safety issues overall, although they did see 80% phospholark 2 reduction indicating um, PD was achieved. So this molecule was discontinued to favor another molecule in their pipeline, DNL151, which supposedly has better PK. So I think everybody will be watching this closely, both Denali and Biogen, to see if, um, if there is efficacy, although we might have to wait a couple of years to see that given the nature of the disease's progression, but very interesting. So it'll be also be interesting to see if anybody else brings their LARC2 inhibitors back into the clinic based on this. So compound nine is Pavonistat, um, another super interesting molecule with a cool mechanism. It's a first-in-class molecule and the most advanced uh, NED8 activating enzyme in the clinic, um, and it's intended for cancers. So it's in phase three for leukemia and advanced solid tumors. NAE regulates uh, colon ring ligases. Um, which are you know, key ubiquitin proteasome system mediators that uh, can be abnormally activated in certain cancers. Uh, what's interesting about it is uh, it did receive breakthrough therapy designation in 2020 for high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome, which is kind of a precursor to AML, but it had disappointing clinical efficacy recently uh, relative to chemotherapy. So it turned out the azacitidine regimen that was being used, uh, they had modified that protocol relative to how it's normally given. And that appears to have led to an increased uh, background efficacy from that drug alone. So that result was disclosed at ASCO, and it appears that the molecule is no longer being uh, developed. Um, one thing chemically that's really cool about this molecule is if you look at it, you wouldn't, it wouldn't be obvious to you, it certainly wasn't obvious to me, that this is actually a covalent mechanism-based uh, molecule. So the way this works is the sulfamate actually is acylated by a carboxylic acid on NED8 forming a covalent complex. Uh, but it goes beyond that. So what's also really cool is NED8 you know, is not the target. NED8 is the substrate of NAE. So the way this molecule is working is that it is covalently modifying a protein that is the substrate of the intended target resulting in um, inhibition. Very interesting. Uh, the recent article that prompted us to highlight this was actually a DMD article uh, where they shared the human metabolism of this molecule. Excuse me. And that was also interesting because, again, looking at this molecule, I would have assumed that uh, phase two metabolism through the alcohol or cleavage of that sulfamate might be the first things to happen. But surprisingly, the first thing that happens to this molecule is uh, SIP mediated hydroxylation on the ending. Um, so they found that out based on radio labeling. Pretty cool. And last but not least is INCB13739. This is an 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase uh, inhibitor. Uh, so, 11 beta HSD converts inactive glucocorticoids to active ones, such as cortisol. Um, glucocorticoids have a variety of effects, one of which uh, that's super well known is their activity on insulin. So, cortisol suppresses insulin action. Uh, based on that, you can imagine this would have been a very attractive target for type 2 diabetes, and it has been. So over 25 inhibitors have entered the clinic um, for treating a variety of diseases based on uh, this mechanism over the last 10 years, but none of them have advanced to phase 3. Uh, one of the angles for this, for diabetes, was, well, if you could selectively target this target in fatty tissue um, and influence cortisol levels in fatty tissue rather than everywhere else, 
um, that might be beneficial without having um, side effects related to cortisol modulation in the brain and the pituitary gland, for example. So what I thought was cool about this was Insight actually deliberately tried to make something that was more lipophilic to localize to adipose tissue to increase the fat to brain ratio, um, preventing any kind of you know side effects due to target engagement in the brain or peripheral tissues. Uh, it has a 280x fat to brain ratio. So this is an interesting human proof of concept, not only for the target, but also for adipose tissue targeting. So we may see some more examples of that in the near future. Um, and the molecule did demonstrate glucose lowering ability in the clinic, but unfortunately was discontinued uh, and led to the discontinuation of a lot of other programs targeting this target in the industry um, you know, after seeing their data. And that's likely due to the insufficient level of glucose activity um, that's believed to be needed to be uh, efficacious for treating diabetes long term. On a, from a lead optimization perspective or hit identification perspective, it's interesting because uh, because it is trying to mimic cortisone, you can sort of see the three carbonyls um, placed in this molecule, similar to where they might be needed in cortisone's binding to uh, this target. Um, and so they basically broke down the pharmacophore of cortisone, looked at some related inhibitors, uh, took it back to the simplest amide that they could think of, um, which is on the right, and then rebuilt the pharmacophore out from that starting point to get to this molecule. Uh, so like the drug approvals for all of the new molecules of the month, we do highlight you know, why the molecules matter, how the targets were selected, how the hits were ID'd, key steps in lead op, how they bind to their targets, any key assays and tox data, animal data, clinical development, and links to the patents. So if you think uh, learning more about these kinds of molecules would be interesting, um, or any of this extra information would save you time Googling things about molecules, um, uh, ask your company about a premium subscription. So uh, next time we'll be talking about some other topics. So beyond drug approvals and molecules of the month, we do have other features like a chemical substructure search for molecules of month. So you can find, you know, azetidines or your favorite functional group among these case studies. We talk about, again, uh, billion dollar molecules acquired in mergers and acquisitions, the science behind companies that have IPO'd, uh, the science behind new biotech startups focused on drug discovery. So we have an article on AI and machine learning for small molecule drug discovery coming out soon. Um, clinical trial explainers and other literature highlights and uh, news explainers. So if you think any of this stuff would make your life easier, again, ask your company about a subscription. Uh, what's unique about Drug Hunter is, you know, this was really made by scientists for scientists. Um, I started this because I was personally really frustrated with how hard it was to find any relevant, technically deep information about molecules in our industry. So on one end, you have, you know, the news and the digests where their goal is to be first and generate clicks. So they tend to be quick, but don't really go into depth into the science. On the other hand, you have databases like Cortellus and journal articles which obviously are comprehensive and have you know, everything you might need to know, but uh, there's just, you know, there's 2 million articles published a year. And now it doesn't really matter if you have access to the data, if you don't have time to actually do the searches. So we try to balance this. We try to be efficient and easy to read while still being scientifically insightful, uh, tailored to you, PhDs. So we have over 20 PhDs and PharmDs who work on our team to help highlight this stuff for you. Biopharma reviewers working at you know, all kinds of companies like AppBeach, Nantech, and Merck. One of our team members actually works full-time at the FDA, so he covers the clinical pharmacology for us. Uh, we cover over 10,000 abstracts a month, spend over 500 hours as a team uh, per month on uh, molecules of the month alone. Um, so if you think you could use this, again, um, we are happy to work with your company. Um, since we've gone, since I've gone full time on this, uh, we've really started to build and roll out the subscription. So uh, we've added 30 new corporate accounts over the last four months, over 300 new independent subscribers working at um, all kinds of places in the industry, uh, companies in large biopharma like Boehringer Ingelheim, Roche, Genentech, Merck. Uh, if you're at Boehringer Ingelheim, you might not know that your company currently has a global license. So ask your librarian about your subscription. Uh, Genentech similarly is getting a global trial started soon, thanks to one of their departments. Um, and Merck uh, KGAA as well. Um, 
there are plenty of people uh, who find this helpful from all kinds of backgrounds, whether that's in biopharma, startups, universities like Harvard and Caltech, or uh, people working at life science venture uh, funds like Nova Holdings, uh, Google Ventures, and, and more. So that's that. Uh, please stay tuned for part two. And now, if you have any questions on this section, I'm happy to address them. All right, so Melissa, Christy, uh, should I just start looking through the Q&A? Yes, although I don't see any questions. Um, not yet. Okay. All right, uh, here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Is the, okay, it looks like the chat is working. Yep, it's working. It may be that you've done such a great job explaining. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm finally able to look at the chat now. So yeah, hi, hi, Robert. Hi, Jane. Oh, Mohua from Singapore. I remember meeting you. Uh, hi, Vince from San Diego. We're going to host an event in San Diego soon. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, we can have some questions popping into the Q&A yeah, box. Dennis, we have a, a question from, from uh, Robin. Uh, who wants to know, can you comment on the human PK of the second approved molecule? Oh, I'm going to have to go back and look at that one. Are we talking about Lena Kapovir? The HIV molecule? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's it's crazy. They really optimized this drug to have low clearance through, you know, all, all the mechanisms. Um, that was key in their MedCam campaign, which, you know, again, we'll have more details on soon. Um, I think some key things were removing glucuronidation from uh, an aminazole-based amine uh, during, this, during the optim optimization, as well as difluorinating uh, the cyclopentane in that molecule, which uh, really led to a big decrease in metabolism. Uh, is that is that kind of what you were asking? Okay. Well, we will have more on that uh, on the soon, so stay tuned. Okay. Chris says, did you have the explanation of the protein pump inhibitors correct? These should increase the pH in the stomach. Yes. Uh, did I say decrease the pH? They should increase the pH in the stomach, make the stomach less acidic. Did I answer that correctly or um, did I get that wrong, Chris? Okay. We have a question coming in from the chat um, from Vinod who asks, are you planning to showcase computational simulations data like benchmarking efforts uh, to get broader understanding? That's a good question. So we don't, um, well, actually, uh, we do have an article from Schrodinger coming out soon where they'll be talking about some highlights from FVP. Uh, so that might be a good one to look out for. That should be coming out any day now. Yeah, Schrodinger has done uh, a lot of really nice work uh, benchmarking, you know, their methods and things like that. And they have some nice examples from their COVID Alliance project um, that they're going to showcase, which is pretty cool. All right. Uh, if... oh. Okay, well, I think that is it for today. So thanks again, everybody for coming. I uh, hope you all found this as interesting as I did. Um, oh, another question here. I mentioned premium a few times, subscription, will there be a company-wide discount? Uh, we work with companies to set up accounts for teams. So if you just get in touch with Melissa uh, or Christy, melissa at drughunter.com, or submit an inquiry through the website using the contact form, uh, we're happy to work with your company. We work with librarians, um, you know, biotech management, everybody to to get this stuff available for scientists. All right, thank you everybody for coming. Oh, hey, Jen, <laughs> thanks for coming. <laughs>